The book that the, ar the architect of the fascist takeover of America, one of the books that he based his theories on was The Fourth Turning. Uh, William Strauss and Neil Howe uh, look at the, world, the cyclical worldview that many ancients had and many in leadership now. Uh, that's different than, than the linear worldview of progress that's typically taught in a modernistic education. Uh, the view that all things experience the seasons of spring, summer, fall, and winter, and that there's a certain inevitability to chaos even is something that's been embraced by the far right. Um, when, you know, on the far left, chaos is typically something that was just played with in artistic circles in the West, something that was taken seriously, of course, by the communists of East Europe and Asia. But I'm going to just read uh, key segments to this book that, that uh, I found interesting as somebody that's studied philosophy and history and psychology and religion. Page 13. Americans today fear that linearism, alias the American dream, has run its course. Many would welcome some enlightenment about history's patterns and rhythms, but today's intellectual elites offer little that's useful. Caught between the entropy of the chaoticists and the hubris of the linearists, the American people have lost their moorings. There is an alternative. But to grasp it, Americans need to return to the insights of the ancient circle. Nothing would be lost. We can retain our hopeful intuition of progress and our skeptical, skeptical awareness of randomness. Yet at the same time, we can restore the one perspective that we have too long suppressed and the insights that no other perspective can offer. We need to realize that without some notion of historical recurrence, no one can meaningfully discuss the past at all. Why even talk about the founding or decline of a city, a victory or defeat in battle, the rise or passing away of a generation, unless we accept that similar things have happened before and could happen again? Only through recurrence can time reveal the enduring myths that define who we are. We are Arist when Aristotle said that poetry is superior to history, because history only tells us what Alcibiades did or had done to him, he had in mind history as a mere compilation of facts. To matter, history has to do more. It has to reconnect people in time to what Aristotle called the timeless forms of nature. We need to recall that time in its physical essence is nothing but the measurement of cyclicality itself whether the swing of a pendulum, the orbit of a planet, or the frequency of a laser beam. The assumed regularity of a cyclical event is literally all we have to define what time is. Etymologically, the word time comes from tide, an ancient reference to the lunar cycle still retained in sun, such expressions as yuletide and good tidings. Similarly, the word period originally means, meant orbit, as in planetary period, the word annual comes from Annas, whose ancient roots meant circle, the word year and hour come from the same root as the Greek horos, meaning solar period. Anyway, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and here's where he posits that in the same way that an individual goes through developmental stages from, like Erickson talked about, um, the childhood stage, you know, the difference between the childhood stage, the adolescence, the uh, early adult, middle adult, and late adult. There's distinctive patterns, distinctive crises uh, that they go through, uh, crises of identity, crises of just the stage of life. That's the question. That's the crux. Um, and page 16, biologically and socially, a full human life is divided into four phases, childhood, young adulthood, midlife, and elderhood. Each phase of life is the same length as the others, capable of holding one generation at a time, and each phase is associated with a specific role that conditions how its occupants perceive the world and act on those perceptions. I, th I think for uh, a more hopeful development of, of the uh, cyclical nature of development and how the individual developmental stages kind of apply to collectives as well, is Ken Wilber's um, ideal of integral theology, integral psychology. And it acknowledges that stages go through a childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. 
uh, civilizations do, uh, not just individuals. Um, but this is Strauss and Ho's version. This is the version that uh, perhaps the most evil man in the world, Steve Bannon, glommed onto. Strauss and Howe are not evil. This book is not evil. Let me give some examples that uh, they give of um, developmental stages of America, just some of them. They write, in elderhood, the cautionary individualists of the lost generation born 1883 through 1900 were replaced by the hubristic GI generation born 1901-1924 who launched America into an expansive era of material affluence, global power, and civic planning. In midlife, the upbeat GIs were replaced by the helpmate's silent generation born 1925 through 1942 who applied their expertise and sensitivity to fine-tune the institutional order while mentoring the passions of youth. In young adulthood, the conformist silent were replaced by the narcissistic boom generation, 43 to 60, who asserted the primacy of self and challenged the alleged moral vacuity of the institutional order. In childhood, the indulged boomers were replaced by the neglected 13th generation, born 61 through 81, who are left unprotected at a time of cultural convulsion and adolescent self-discovery, known in pop culture as Generation X. Its name here reflects the fact that it is literally the 13th generation to call itself American. Now, that's something I didn't realize. Gen X, the 13th generation of America, with its 13 stripes and shit. That is very interesting. Okay, let's see. Where were some of the other notable? Okay. Um, let me see, see, see. Okay. Uh, here's, some, here's some examples of um, cycles through history that, that follow the uh, seasonal cycles of spring, winter, fall. If awake, um, an awakening is the other solstice of the saculum. If you uh, have this edition of the book, it's on page 41. If awakenings are the summer... Wait. An awakening is the other solstice of the saculum. It is to crisis as summer is to winter, love to strife. Within each lies the causal germ of its opposite. In the second quarter of the saculum, the confidence born of growing security triggers an outburst of love that leads to disorder. In the fourth quarter, the anxiety born of growing insecurity triggers an outburst of strife they reestablish his order. An awakening thus serves as a cycle marker, reminding a society that it is halfway along a journey traversed many times by its ancestors. Worth now observes that periods of religious unrest have, of course, been regarded as portents of change, as historical watersheds, at least since Herodotus. If awakenings are the summers and crises the winters of human experience, transitional eras are required. A spring-like era must traverse the path from crises to awakening. An autumnal era, the path from awakening to crisis. Where the two secular solstices are solutions to needs eventually created by one another, the secular equinoxes must be directional opposites of one another. Where the post-crisis era warms and lightens, the post-awakening era chills and darkens. Where the cyclical spring brings consensus, order, and stability, the autumn brings argument, fragmentation, and uncertainty. Until recently, scholars seldom inquired into the periodicity of these prophetic and ecstatic eras of modern history, but that is changing. In a provocative essay announcing that against all other predictions of 19th century socialist religious movements have survived and flourished in the modern world, Princeton socialist Robert Worthnow reports that revitalization movements have been distributed neither evenly nor at random in space and time. In fact, their timing since the Renaissance is quite regular. His list of movements is presented here, along with their two-decade spans of peak enthusiasm. The dry phase revitalization movement is dropped in favor of a Gnostic image long popular among Westerners, the image of an awakening of the spirit or simply awakening. Uh, the 1530s, the Protestant Reformation. The 1630s, Puritan Awakening, 1740s, Pietist Awakening, 1830s, Evangelical Utopian Awakening, 1960s, New Age Awakening. 
These movements had much in common. All were loaded with passionate attacks against the morality of cultural and religious norms that felt old at the time. All were spearheaded by young people. All set forth new normative priorities, what today we call values, and all except the last followed a predictable timing. Each was separated from the prior awakening by the approximate length of a seculum, and each occurred roughly halfway between two neighboring crises. It's interesting stuff. Uh, so I'm going to go straight to his predictions. Uh, chapter 10. You can read the rest of the book if you want it. I just want to kind of give you uh, an introductional setup before I give you the predictions. Mind you, this was written in 1997. And using the study of historical cyclical patterns, this is what he predicted for the fourth turning. Winter in America. And, and once again, these cycles are cycles within cycles as well. Uh, there's larger 2,000-year cycles uh, that are celebrated throughout history by groups that see the, the cosmic will of the solar system has made a complete turn. And that seems to co coincide with a major shift in season. Within that, there are smaller cycles. Within those, there are smaller cycles still. Sometime around the year 2005, perhaps a few years before or after, America will enter the fourth turning. In the middle, oh oh, in the middle of the odds, America will be a very different society than in the late 1920s, when the last crises catalyzed. The nation will be more fluent, enjoy better health, possess more technology, encompass a larger and more diverse population, command more powerful weapons, but the same could be said about every other unraveling era society compared it to its predecessor. They were not exempt from the seculum, nor will we be. A spark will ignite a new mood. Today the same spark would flame briefly, but then extinguish, its last flicker merely confirming and deepening the unraveling era mindset. This time, though, it will catalyze a crisis. In retrospect, the spark might seem as ominous as a financial crash, as ordinary as a national election, or as trivial as a tea party. It could be a rapid succession of small events in which the ominous, the ordinary, and the trivial com are commingled. Recall that a crisis catalyst involves scenarios distinctly imaginable eight or ten years in advance based on recent unraveling era trends. The following circa 2005 scenarios might seem plausible. Here's one scenario. scenario. Beset by a fiscal crisis, a state lays claim to its residents' federal tax monies. Declaring this an act of succession, the president obtains a federal injunction. The governor refuses to back down. Federal marshals enforce the court orders. Similar tax rebellions spring up in other states. Treasury bill auctions are suspended. Militia violence breaks out. Cyber terrorists destroy IRS databases. U.S. Special Forces are put in alert. Demands issue for a new constitutional convention. <coughs> That's just one scenario. Does it sound <coughs> anything like anything we've experienced? In many ways, yes. As I reach for my hash pipe, Well, a wiser man than me once said, if you can't find your pipe, that means you probably are high enough. So, horrible scenario number two that we may have already experienced. A global terrorist group blows up an aircraft and announces it possesses a portable nuclear weapons. The United States and its allies launch a preemptive strike. The terrorists threaten to retaliate against an American city. Congress declares war and authorizes unlimited house-to-house -house searches. Opponents charge that the president concocted the emergency for political purposes. A nationwide strike is declared. Foreign capital flees the U.S. Number three, worst possible case scenario. An impasse over the federal budget reaches a stalemate. The president and Congress both refuse to back down, triggering a near total government shutdown. Never seen one of those before. 
The president declares emergency powers. Congress rescinds his authority. Dollar and bond prices plummet. The president threatens to stop social security checks. <coughs> Congress rescinds his authority. Dollar and bond prices plummet. The president threatens to stop social security checks. Congress refuses to raise the debt ceiling. Default looms. Wall Street panics. Never experienced that before. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention announced the spread of new communicable viruses. The disease reaches densely populated areas, killing some. <laughs> Let's try a lot more than some. Congress enacts mandatory quarantine measures. The President orders the National Guard to throw prophylactic cordons around unsafe neighborhoods. Mayors resist. Urban gangs battle suburban militias. Calls mount for the President to declare martial law. Never heard of that before! Fifth scenario. Growing anarchy throughout the former Soviet republics prompts Russia to conduct training exercises around its borders. Lithia erupts in civil war. Lithuania erupts in civil war. Negotiations break down. U.S. diplomats are captured. Publicly taunted. The president airlifts troops to rescue them and orders ships to the Black Sea. Iran declares its allegiance with Russia. Gold and oil prices soar. Congress debates restoring the draft. Four out, of, four out of five ain't bad. Uh, let's see. Okay. And then he goes on. It's highly unlikely that any one of these scenarios will actually happen. How about four out of five? What is likely, however, is that the cataclysm, cataclysm, the catalyst will unfold according to a basic crisis dynamic that underlies all of these scenarios. An initiation, initial spark will trigger a chain reaction of unyielding responses and further emergencies. The core elements of these scenarios, debt, civic decay, global disorder, will matter more than the details which the catalyst will juxtapose and connect in some unknowable way. If foreign societies are also entering a fourth turning, this could <coughs> accelerate the reaction chain. And, oh, there we are. Let's see. Time will pass, perhaps another decade, before the surging good propels America to the fourth turning's grave moment of opportunity and danger. The climax of the crisis. What will it be? Trump. Recall from Chapter 9 that a climax takes a form wholly unforeseeable from the advanced distance of 25 years. Imagine some national and probable, probably global volcanic eruption, initially flowing along channels of distress that were created during the unraveling era and further widened by the catalyst. Shh. Trying to foresee where the eruption will go and once it bursts free of the channels is like trying to predict the exact fault line of an earthquake. All you know in advance is something about the molten ingredients of the climax, which could include <coughs> the following. Economic distress. With public debt and default, entitlement trust funds and bankruptcy mounting poverty and unemployment, trade wars collapsing financial markets and hyperinflation or deflation. Social distress. With violence fueled by class, race, nativism, or religion and abetted by armed gangs and underground militias and mercenaries hired by walled communities. Cultural distress, with the media plunging into a dizzying decay and a decency backlash in favor of state censorship. <coughs> Technological distress, with crypto-anarchy, high-tech oligarchy, and biogenetic chaos. Ecological distress, with atmospheric damage, energy or water shortages, and new diseases. Political distress, with institutional collapse, open tax revolts, one-party hegemony, major constitutional change, successionist authoritarianism, and altered national borders. Build a wall. Military distress with war against terrorists or foreign regimes equipped with weapons of mass destruction. Wow. Now, let's see if there's a... Oh, this is interesting. 13ers, Gener Generation X people entering midlife. He calls us the Doom Players. Well, I am a Capricorn, so that would make sense for me. Prophets of doom were often Capricorns. Jesus himself. Now, once more, the belt is tight, and we summon the proper expression of horror as we look back at our wasted youth, said F. Scott Fitzgerald, 
after the crash that hit his peers at the cusp of what should have been their highest earning years. A generation with no second acts, he called his lost peers, but they proved him wrong. They ended their frenzy and settled down, thus helping to unjangle the American mood. Where their missionary predecessors had entered midlife, believing in vast crusades, the post-crash loss skipped the moralisms and returned directly to the basics of life. What is moral is what you feel good after, declared Ernest Hemingway. What is immoral is what you feel bad after. Everything depends on the use to which it is put, explained Reinhold Niebuhr, on behalf of a generation that did useful things regardless of faith, a role that the missionaries chose not to play. Albeit, historically, the missionaries have been tools of the fascist empire to wedge their way into other countries that they want to exploit. This no, act, this no second act generation lent America the grit to survive dark global emergencies and in the end to triumph over them. In the Great Depression, the lost were hard hit but refused to ask for public favors. In World War II, they manned the draft boards, handed out the ration coupons, mapped the invasions, dispatched the bomber fleets. They gave the orders that killed thousands but saved millions. From blood and guts, generals, to give them hell presidents, the lost knew how to prevail over long odds and harsh criticism. This was the last time the nomad archetype entered the fourth turning. In a recent genre of action films, from war games and Back to the Future to Terminator and Independence Day, a stock drama unfolds. A young protagonist alone, unprepared and immersed, immersed in a junkie culture, is chosen by chance to decide the fate of humanity. The situation looks dicey. The protagonist, too, has slim expectations of success. <coughs> But at a pivotal moment, this lonely wayfarer challenges destiny, deals with the stress, zeroes in on what matters, does what is required, comes out on top. The most popular video games following the same script, stress, one-on-one -on -one action, and deft timing. Find the treasure, grab the tools, rescue a princess, save the kingdom, slay the enemy, get out alive. Everything is yes, no, full of code words and secret places. In a style one TV executive calls Indiana Jones meets Game Show. I've glimpsed our future, warns a high school valedictorian in the film Say Anything. And all I can say is, go back! The message to her classmates is understandable because no mad generations, what Christian Slater refers to as a long list of dead famous wild people, have always been the ones who lose ground in wealth, education, security, longevity, and other measures of progress. Yet they have also been the generation who lay out the fulcrum between triumph and tragedy, the ones who hoist their society through the darkest days of crisis. The onset of the fourth turning will find 13ers retaining their troubled reputation. The only change being the America's troubled age bracket will then be perceived as more 40-ish than 20-ish. They will carry the reputation of having come of an age at a time when good manners and civic habits were not emphasized in homes and schools. With their arrival, midlife will lose moral authority and gain toughness. Their culture will be a hodgepodge of unblending styles and polyethnic currents that will reflect the centrifugal impulse from which many Americans, including 13 years, will now be eager to escape. Actually, that's some of the language that uh, Bannon saw as prophetic, that they will somehow come into the arms of the new right. It boggles my fucking mind how close that he fucking got it. This is like the movie halftime, you know, where they play the little music. Get yourself a smoke, get yourself a beverage, get yourself some thin mints. Go to the restroom, please do not pee in our lovely theater chairs. All right. <sighs> Reality is for those who can handle drugs. Where were we? In the economy, 13ers will fare significantly worse than boomers. <laughs> they will fan out across an unusually wide range of money and career outcomes. A few will be wildly successful, a large number will be destitute, while most will be losing ground but doing tolerably. 
The crisis era's image of a middle-aged worker will be a modest wage job hopper who retains the flexibility to change life directions at a snap. The uberization of all jobs that now puts a cap, a, a low ceiling on pretty much all jobs. The prototype midlife success story will be the entrepreneur who excels at cunning flexibility and high-tech ingenuity. Uh, once again, written in 1997. That's pretty much Silicon Valley he's describing there. The prototype failure will be the ruined gambler, broke but still trying. The high-risk harbors where 13ers will have bet their stray cash during the unraveling. From Iodo, from lottos to Indian casinos to derivative markets will, like this generation, be stigmatized and left to rot. As they confront their money problems amid a mood of deepening crisis, 13ers will take pride in their ability to have a life. And while off their families from financial woes, their divorce rate will be well below that of the midlife silent and boomers. They will clamp down on children in exchange for financial help. Many will invite their better off parents to live with them. Well, it's not an exchange for financial help. It's just, I feel like it's the right thing to do. I believe a multi-generational tribe is the ideal developmental environment for a child. Surveying the crisis era detritus of the unraveling 13ers will see the opposite of what the midlife saw, silent saw in the awakening era a wreckage of the high where the silent felt claustrophobic yearning to break free in a world that felt too closed 13ers will feel agoraphobic yearning to root in a world that feels too open where the silent were torn between the social socially necessary and the personally desirable 13ers will be torn between the personally necessary and the socially desirable grip with deeply felt Obligations, 13ers, 13ers will resist the idea of relaxing their survival instincts, yet will sense the need to restore a sense of community. They will widen the continuing dispersions of technology and culture. They will vote for politicians who promise to reverse it. Middle-aged, Hispanic, Asian, Arab Americans will embrace their racial identities, yet will learn for new ties to the communal core. The unraveling, unraveling's initial 13th pop elite will lose influence as their peers of the old ways and seek something simpler and less frenzied. Okay, and this is where he kind of peters out in his descriptions of that. But God damn, did he didn't he uh, hit some accurate predictions? Oh, this is interesting. As a crisis rages on, the era's stark new communitarianism will require thirteeners to rivet new grids in place. New breed mayors and governors will abandon old labels and alliances, patch together people and technology, and rekindle public support for community purpose. That's actually a good idea! Why don't we do that? A system of communes that are inter-autonomous with each other. Having grown up in a time when walls were being dismantled, families dissolved, and loyalties discarded, 13s, 13 or power brokers will reconstruct the social barriers that produce civic order. They will convince first to... They will connive first to get the people behind them, next to bribe or threaten people into doing what's needed. Well, that's what the right's doing. The left only uh, threatens people that are oppressing workers. Anyway. And then to solidify those arrangements into something functional. They won't worry about the obviously insoluble and won't fuss over the merely annoying. Their politicians won't brim with compassion or nuance and won't care if they have to win ugly. Yeah. To them, the outcome will matter more than democracy's ritual aesthetics. Their hands strengthened by the demands of crisis, 13ers will sweep aside procedural legalisms and promises legislated by old regimes, much to the anguish of the octogenarian silent. They won't mind uttering and listening to the soundbite that seems to sum up a situation with eloquent efficiency. To critics, the new style of the 13er urban leadership will appear unlearned, poorly rooted in values, even corrupt, but it will work. Ugh. I wish that wasn't fucking true. <clears throat> this generation's institutional rootlessness will make its leaders and electorates highly volatile, capable of extreme cross currents. Lacking much stake in the older order, many 13ers might impulsively welcome the notion of watching it break into pieces. They won't regard the traditional safety nets as important to their lives. The real experience of their own circles will reinforce their view that when people lose jobs or money, they can find a way to cope, deal with it, and move on. Looking back on their own lives, they will conclude that many of the awakening and unraveling era trends that may have felt good to older generations didn't work so well for them or for the nation. 
Come the crisis, many 13ers will feel that emergency action is necessary to recreate the kind of secure world they will feel was denied them in childhood. Oh, and here's, <clears throat> here's an interesting bit. Middle-aged 13ers will be the only ones capable of deflecting more dangerous boomer tendencies. The boomers won't check themselves, nor will millennials. So the task will fall to 13ers to force the boomer priest warriors to give it a rest when the fervor gets too deep, to get real when the sacrifices outweigh the future reward. A 13er may indeed be the intrepid statesman, general, or presidential advisor who prevents some righteous old Aquarian form, no, a righteous old Aquarian from losing the fateful lightning and turning the world's lights out. Jesus. At or just after the crisis climax, 13ers will supplant boomers in national leadership. History warns that they could quickly find themselves playing a real-world Sim City, facing quick triage choices about who and what to sacrifice and when and how. They will need every bit of those old Doom player joystick skills, the deft timing, the instinctive sense of what counts and what doesn't, the ability always to move on from one problem to the next. Whatever they do, they will get more than their share of the blame and less than their share of the credit. As the crisis resolves, the society will be fully in 13er hands. If all ends well, their security-minded leadership will usher the society, society away from urgent crusades and into the next high. If not, 13ers will be left with no choice but to yank younger generations by the collars, appraise what's left of their society, and start anew. Wow. Let's, let's hear what they said about... Um, Millennials, this is interesting, from 97. I promise as a good American to do my part. 100,000 people chanted on Boston Commons in 1933. I will help President Roosevelt bring back good times. Those young GIs were touted by Malcolm Cowley as brilliant college graduates who pictured a future in which everyone would be, would be made secure by collective planning and social discipline Whereas at the same time, Crowley's own lost peers had grown disillusioned and weary from hearing so much pessimism about their future. During the lost peak coming of age years, the youth suicide rate rose by half and the homicide rate by 700%, while American youth showed precious little improvement in rates of illiteracy or college entry. A few years before the crash of 1929, youth took the most dramatically positive change ever recorded. All of a sudden, young Americans turned away from cynicism, suicide, and crime and towards optimism, education, and civic fealty. A new vernacular spoke of trust, geometric order, level-headed regular guys who were on the square. Fit, uh, fit in and could be counted on. Underneath, we really thought we were all right, Gene Shefford recalled. If the souring economy dampened many a career and marriage plans, that only steeled the GI determination to act on the 4-H motto, make the best better. Older people lent them direction and help. America cannot always build the future for our youth, said FDR on the eve of World War II, but we can build our youth for the future. Interesting. We can, America cannot always build the future for our youth. Well, why, why the fuck not? Said FDR. But we can build our youth for the future. Okay. I think he was talking about the doom that was ahead. Wow. Having received 80% of a huge youth vote in 1932 and 85% in 1936, by far the largest such mandates have recorded, FDR proclaimed that the very objectives of young people have changed away from the dream of the golden ladder each individual for himself and towards the dream of a broad highway on which thousands of your fellow men and women are advancing with you. Before long, the highways and seaways were full of generation now, full, fully in uniform, heralded by Ger General Marshall as the best damn kids in the world. A world they proceeded to conquer. The difficult we do at once. Their CBs famously proclaimed, The impossible takes a little longer. This was the last time the hero archetype entered a fourth turning. Interesting. Power Rangers! Go, go, Power Rangers! Power Rangers are wholesome kid soldiers in bright primary color uniforms. No relation to the junk fed mutant turtles of the 13th era child era power rangers were have provided the unraveling the unraveling's leading toy role models for children when summoned these ordinary youths transformed themselves 
into thunderbolting evil fighters. Cheerful, confident, energetic, Power Rangers are nurtured to succeed in the face of great odds. Whatever they do, from displaying martial arts or piloting high-tech weaponry, they do as a choreographed group. Their very motto, the power of teamwork overcomes all. Speaks of strength and cooperation, energy and conformity, virtue and duty. Their missions are not chosen by themselves, but by an incorporeal, incorporeal, el their missions are not chosen by themselves, but by an incorporeal elder in whose vision and wisdom they have total trust. Come the fourth turning, coming of age, millennials will have a lot in common with those action toys. And as we have seen, that incorporeal, incorporeal elder is the goddamn internet as manipulated by people like Steve Bannon. Who is a real life goddamn evil genius? Go, go, Power Rangers! New pop culture trends will be big, bland, and friendly. In film, young stars will be linked with positive themes, display more modesty in sex and language, and link new civic purpose to screen violence. In sports, players will become more coachable, more loyal to teams and fans, and less drawn to trash talk, in-your-face slam dunks, and end-zone taunts. In pop music, millennials will resurrect the old ritual of happy group singing. From old campfire favorites to new tunes with simple melodies and upbeat lyrics. Sounds a lot like Americana. Whether in film, sports, or music, the first millennial celebrities will win praise as good role models for children. Good job, guys! The Great Devaluation. The Great Tribulation. May occur right around the time millennials fill the 20s age bracket, just as they are emerging as a truly national generation, the pride of their elders. Whatever their new economic hardships, and they could be severe, Millennials will not rebel, but will instead mobilize for public purpose. Older people will be anguished to see these good kids suffer for the mistakes of others. Boomers and 13ers will together urgently resist the prospect that a second consecutive generation might be denied access to the American dream. No matter how shattered the economy, no matter how fiscally stretched the government, places will be found for the rising generation. To accomplish this, the status of young workers will be standardized. Their job titles shortened and pay gaps narrowed. That'd be nice to see. Millennials will respond with a cheerful patience reminiscent of depression era GIs. Government will play an important role in their lives as people of all ages jointly resolve to remove any barrier to a bright millennial future. <sighs> This youthful hunger for social discipline and centralized authority could lead millennial youth brigades to lend mass to dangerous demagogues. The risk of class warfare will be especially grave if the 20% of millennials who are poor as children, 50% in inner cities, and let's face it, way higher than that out in the bottoms of West Kentucky, 50% inner cities come of age seeing their peer bonded paths to generational progress blocked by elder inertia. Unraveling era adults who are today chiseled by school uniforms will be truly frightened by the millennials' crisis era collectivism. As Sinclair Lewis warned of GIs in the 1930s, older Americans will look abroad at rigidly ordered societies and wonder whether uh, among youth with so much power and so little doubt it can't happen here. Wherever their politics lead, millennials will become identified with a new American mainstream, a fledgling middle class just waiting to assert itself. They will vex Hollywood's unraveling era elite with their cool rationalism. They will vex feminists by accepting a new mystique between the sexes. They will vest 
They will vex free marketers with their demands for trade barriers, government regulation, labor standards, and public works. Just as the unraveling's political agenda centered around children, the agenda of the next New Deal will center around young adults. You know, with the school loan crisis as it is, that's the law jam right there. The school loan crisis. In exchange, old boomers will impose a new duty of compulsory service, notwithstanding those elders' own youthful draft resistance. Millennials will not oppose this because they will see it in their path to public achievement. If inducted for war, millennials will cast aside any earlier pacifism and march to duty. Like Power Rangers, they will not be averse to militarized mass violence, just to uncontrolled personal violence. Quite the opposite of boomer use back in the awakening, national leaders will not hesitate to mobilize and deploy them in huge armies. Where boomer youths once screamed against duty and discipline, boomer elders will demand and receive both from millennial troops. Near the climax of crisis, the full power of this rising generation will assert itself, providing their society with a highly effective instrument for imposing order on an unruly world. They will appear capable of glorious collective deeds of conquering distant lands, of potently executing any command that may be issued. Quite the opposite of the boomers' awakening era casualties in Vietnam, which weaken the public will, will to fight. The millennials' heroic sacrifices will only add to the national resolve. That seems to be the case with how Black Lives Matter uh, and the new anti-fascist movement has emerged. As a crisis era president commits as a crisis-era president commits the society to clear a path for a bright future, the political juggernaut of millennial youth will stand squarely with their beloved commander-in-chief. This generation of young heroes will follow wherever the great champion leads, whether to triumph or disaster. Hallelujah. Whew. Oh. And this is the children of the millennials. Or if you're an older parent, like many of us in the Gen X, who waited till we were nearly dead to have children. Huh. The new silent entering childhood. Sweet innocence. Overprotective was a word first used to describe our parents, Benita Isa recalls of her silent peers' depressionary youth. When adults ruled the world, child's world with a stern hand. Back in the GI childhood years, no one spoke of overprotection because the crusade to protect the child's world was then just getting started. As Literary Digest demanded a reassertion of parental authority, parents injected what historian Daniel Rogers described as a new ex explicit insistence on conformity in a child life. <clears throat> Thus raised GIs passed through childhood, showing America's largest measurable one-generation improvement in health, size, and education, along with big reductions in youth crime and suicide. <clears throat> um, by the way, he seems to uh, use the silent generation as a good thing. Silent as in like lack of conflict and catastrophe. Oh God, I hope my youth get to enjoy that. By the time the silent entered school, however, clean cut behavior was taken for granted. No, it's not. Everybody's got long, crazy hair now. Hey, can't be 90%. I guess you... Guess you can't be 100%, right? That's where he was wrong. By the time the silent entered school, however, clean cut behavior was taken for granted. The leading parenting book suggested a no nonsense, total situation parenting with behavioral rules that critics liken to the house breaking of puppies. Whenever movie kids like Alfalfa or Shirley Temple encountered adults, they would mind their manners. During the war years, America had perhaps the best behaved teenagers in its history, but controversy simmered about whether the long absence of soldiering fathers would cause them to grow up a little uncertain of themselves. Times were indeed fearful for children, since any day could bring devastating news. Frank Conroy recalls having asked, as a child, <clears throat> asked as a boy, what was in the newspapers when there wasn't a war going on? This was the last time the artist archetype entered a fourth turning.
Many of the social conditions we think of as black problems are merely white problems a generation later, William Raspberry has observed. I think it'd be more vice versa. Early in the awakening, the children in America's urban cores were the harbingers of new trends that afflicted the whole society by the start of the unraveling, disintegrating families, absentee fathers, teen mothers, rising crime, failing performance in school. Okay, the effects of poverty. And now white people are becoming impoverished too. So that's a pretty damn good <clears throat> prediction. They have become shut-ins, tucked behind walls, sleeping in bulletproof bathtubs, escorted to school by anxious adults and swept off late night streets by police curfews. Even though the actual risk of violence in many inner cities is beginning to recede, come the fourth turning variants of these 1990s era inner city child swaddling trends will be visible all across America from downtown to suburb to small town. Imagine being a child living in a world surrounded by a concrete wall originally raised to ward off dangerous neighbors. The danger has receded, hopefully. The enemies are now more distant, but the concrete remains. Adults don't bother to remove the wall because they're busy and find it an easy way to keep track of their kids. Come the fourth turning, the rules a child must follow will begin outlasting the original reasons for those rules. Picture high-rise children still barricaded behind walls in a time of reduced crime on the streets below. Picture compulsory kindergarten uniforms in a time of wholesale new trends in young adult fashion. Picture a vigorous police presence in a time of generally compliant teenagers. What in the unraveling felt like sensible protections will now, in the crisis, reach a state of stifling suffocation at the hands of parents and governments alike? The babies of the aughts will be America's next artist archetype, the new silent generation. Their link to crisis will be as the vulnerable seeds of society's future that must be saved while the emergency is overcome and the enemy defeated. They will be the crisis era's fearful watchers, tiny helpers. And if all goes well, lucky inheritors. Tethered close to home, they will do little de deeds like recycling, keyboarding, tending to elders. The circa 2020 equivalents of planting World War II victory gardens or collecting scrap metal. The new silent will look on adults as competent and in control. Crisp rights and wrongs will be a common adult message unquestioning Compliance, the expected response. New silent kids will not be encouraged to take chances or do things on their own. Naivety and sweet innocence will be presumed to flow from those of tender age. In reverse from the unraveling, deviancy will be re redefined upwards. Youth sex, abortion, abortion, and substance use will remain at low levels. Parental divo divorce will be re-stigmatized. Public talk about private matters <clears throat> will be the newly taboo in the media. <laughs> Unlike today, the bulk of the family disruptions will be involuntary, and the result, not a personal choice or dysfunction, but a crisis era forces beyond the family's control. It is interesting. Um, there was a much higher divorce rate in the uh, boomers, I think, in, in some ways. A lot of the Gen Xers have... Um, I don't know, stay together as, for solidarity as co-parents with being able to be mindful of the protection of their children. I can certainly relate to that. That's why as much as I loathe my enemy, the fascists of America, I'd really prefer not to have like a full-on blazing pew-pew civil war if I can avoid it. <laughs> oh, yeah. and I hope that some of those folks feel the same moving with the seasons ha! check this out here's his advice for dealing with changing seasons oh preparing for the fourth turning Okay. <clears throat> I 
actually I'm gonna pause this one and just do a new, whole new one for the fourth turning because it's preparing for in the middle of chapter 11 what to do and how to prepare for the fourth turning that we're already in the middle of let's see how we've done given the gravity of the coming say killer winter you may be asking can anybody do anything about it saith the preacher to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. In each of the four seasons of life and nature there are things a person should and should not do. There is no single style of behavior, no one maxim for right living that is appropriate for all ages. The spring of life can be carefree, its autumn should not be. With land likewise there is a time to sow, a time to reap, a time when almost anything will grow, a time when almost nothing will. If you expect acorns to fall in spring or tulips to bloom in autumn, you condemn yourself to frustration. The same seasonable, seasonable principle applies to the saculum, which appears to be his, uh, uh, their fa fancy Greek word for uh, cycles of the cosmos. And they stop just short of astrotheology in this book. They don't touch it though. The same seasonal principle applies to the saculum. Cyclical time teaches you not just to accept the rhythms of history, but to look for ways to make use of them, to fulfill your role in those rhythms as best you can. It is an antidote to fatalism. If you wish to get more out of life or nature, you have the power to do that, but it takes work. You and your society have the power to influence history, but that takes work too. And always your efforts must be appropriate for the time. A common modern reaction is to seek to avoid harsh seasons altogether. Whether facing old age or winter, many of us look for a bridge or a wall or a cure. Anything that can keep unwanted seasons from interfering with our fixed purpose. That's, that's the essence of linear thinking. If you follow that strategy, you'd better be right. If not, you could find yourself totally flattened when times turn hard. The recent anxiety that America is on the wrong truck reflects an unease with linear thinking and an instinctive sense that a secular winter is nearing. That instinct is sound, but seldom reflected by the popular prescriptions or paradigms. Is new thinking required? On the contrary, prepare for the fourth turning. America needs old thinking. As with life or nature, the proper plan for the saculum is to move with, not against the seasons. We should participate in seasonal activities by taking advantage of the current turning. That sounds like uh, what the fascists have certainly done. Avoid post-seasonal behavior by terminating habits that were appropriate for the prior turning but are not the, for the current one. That means when tactics are no longer working, try something different. Make pre-seasonal pre -seasonal preparations by trying to anticipate the needs and opportunities of the next turning. To be seasonal, America should take maximum advantage of the uh, current unraveling at any phase of life. A person can attend to its needs and engage in its pleasures well or badly. Middle age can be the prime of life or disappointment. Autumn can be a season of bounty and beauty or a waste and decay. Much as, what we, much as we can experience a good or bad midlife or autumn, a person or society can have a good or a bad unraveling. This is certainly the case today. The diversity and complexity of 1990s era America are thrilling when intelligently explored. The popular culture at its best is outstandingly creative. New personal technologies are challenging, exciting, and broadly affordable, lending unprecedented access to every crevasse of human knowledge, culture, and experience. Travel to distant lands is relatively safe and broadly permitted. Persons with talent and market leverage can earn and keep enormous sums of money. The economy differs vast. The economy offers vast quantities of interesting things to consume. We should enjoy and harness all that while we can, because much of it will be less available or feel less pleasurable in the fourth turning. At the same time, there is plenty to guard against. Diversity is producing new racial enclaves. The pop culture at its worst is violent and debasing. 
New technologies are eroding traditional human interactions, manners, and civic duties. <clears throat> Facebook certainly borne that out, hasn't it? The gap between rich and poor is daunting. Yes, that's an understatement. America consumes more than it produces and goes ever more deeply into debt. We should avoid and control these excesses now, while realizing that society will address them more fundamentally in the fourth turning. We can try to make the current turning the splendid secular autumn, but we can't change it into spring. We would be foolish to try to eradicate all the vices of an unraveling while still in an unraveling. We just can't do it. To avoid being post-seasonal, America should stop awakening era behavior. In midlife, a person is expected to relinquish youth. The maxim, at your age, applies to middle-aged people who behave in ways that might be called right for younger people, but not for them. A reckless naivete can be charming in a 25-year-old, but not a person twice that age. Don't I know it. In nature, a farmer should not let corn go and harvest it past its time because the rains are no longer nourishing and will now cause it to decay. Similarly, an unraveling era society must let go of old habits that made sense 20 years ago, but no longer do. The year 1997 is not 1979, and we should not pretend that it is. A stock joke of the 1990s is how ridiculous people look in photos taken in the 1970s. <clears throat> Beyond clothes and haircuts, most Americans have substantially re redirected their lives since the Consciousness Revolution. If parents, professors, or employ employers try to treat children, students, and young workers in ways that made sense in the 1960s, they will succeed only in looking eccentric and <clears throat> trigger perverse reactions. In today's Congress, if today's Congress tried to behave like the great 89th, it would be greeted by hoots and derision from a public that today reserves the word great for few things other than a pro sports playoff. Whenever public figure figures do something that conjures up the prior turning, they fail, often spectacularly. This goes into the absurdity of Trump and why his absurdity worked in getting the powerful what they wanted. The optimistic part is the very manual that Bannon uses shows that they are time limited in what they are doing. Oh, interesting. Uh, whenever public figures do something that conjures up the prior turning, they fail often spectacularly. In the high, when MacArthur wanted to cross the Yalu and widen the Korean War, the president and public wanted none of it because the time for total war had passed. Done with that shit. Joe McCarthy was eventually censored by a citizenry that a decade earlier had tolerated the imprisonment uh, without trial of Japanese-American Cito enemies. The same thing happened during the awakening. LBJ's Vietnam Brain Trust pursued a global containment strategy and a selective service channeling policy that Americans supported in the high, in the high but now rejected. In the early 1950s, politicians could ruin people's careers by accusing them of disloyalty, but in the early 1970s, Spiro Agnew's attacks on nonconformists only enhanced their careers and hastened the ruin of his. And consider President Nixon. From his constant appeals to a silent majority to his closet profanities, to his famous image of walking on the beach in a suit, he was a secular anachronism, a first-turning man trying to lead a second-turning nation. In the current unraveling era, many people have paid dearly for post-seasonal behavior. Gary Hart's political career ended over a dalliance far less serious than the Chappaquiddick incident that Ted Kennedy's career survived in 1969. Bob Packwood had to resign from the Senate when his critics applied unraveling era standards to revelations about his awakening era behavior. Jocelyn Elders lost their Surgeon General Generalship for comments made in the media that would have been praised two decades earlier. Calvin Klein had to withdraw jeans ads flaunting an adolescent sexuality that would have seemed tame in the 1970s. The Clinton's 1994 proposal to create a vast new federal health care edifice conjured up Johnson's 1964 proposals for Medicare and Medicaid LBJ's plans were seasonal and sailed through, but Clinton's were post-seasonal and crashed. To be pre-seasonal, America should prepare now for the fourth turning. 
Wise, 55-year-old, save money and preserve good health habits, realizing that old age must pass. Old age must come. They do what they can to make it a good time of life, not a scourge of poverty and infirmity. And autumn wise farmers prepare against an early and hard winter. They protect their harvest, gather their seeds, and stock their fuel. Similarly, a wise society begins an un unraveling to guard against the dangers of the coming crisis. Even when people do not think seasonally, or an instinctive feel for the cyclicality of time could prompt available, valuable pre-crisis preparations. In the last third turning amid the complexities of the 1910s and the circuses of the 1920s, the missionary generation launched pre-seasonal trends that greatly aided the nation in the ensuing Depression and War. Parents, teachers, and scoutmasters restored order to a child's world. Cultural czars cleaned up Hollywood and baseball. Preachers of divergent faiths issued parallel missives against civic decay. Local officials tested new social programs. World War I aside, national officials avoided new debt. None of this was done explicitly to prepare for bad times, but it had that effect, much to America's later advantage. The unraveling era prior to the Civil War illustrates how society can fail to act pre-seasonally. Through the 1940s and 50s, the moral, pre the moral preachings of midlife transcendentalists went beyond fixing families and protecting children to trying to win old arguments dating back to the 1930s, their equivalent of the 1960s. Transcendental opinion kept polarizing North and South with little hint of a common values agenda. Politicians pursued what was quite literally a linear path of procedural compromise as a slavery debate extended due westward from Missouri to Kansas to the Pacific. Meanwhile, spiritualists accelerated the linear Christian path, per fervently proclaiming that the second coming was near. Just as they did in 1844 when hundreds of thousands of Millerites donned ascension robes and climbed hills and rooftops to receive the Lord. By the late 1850s, aging fanatics of all stripes parlayed their awakening era passions into apocalyptic preachings. Thus did the transcendentals take political and military action that many presumed would right all wrongs and prepare for Christ's rule. Riding under the post-seasonal banner of the prior awakening, the Civil War's great champions rose early and rode hard and rode destructively. Pre-seasonality is as functional as post-seasonality is dysfunctional. We admire pre-seasonal purpose when we see it in people. Indeed, America's best-remembered presidents displayed this indeed or oratory before they were elected. The crisis-era steadfastness of Washington and Eisenhower foreshadowed the coming heights, making both generals enormously popular choices for presiding over those eras. In manner and morals, John Kennedy anticipated the consciousness revolution. Nearly alone amid the late awakenings, nervous and hysterical clatter, Ronald Reagan had a feel for the self-assured and jaunty unraveling mood he would later personify. America's two most beloved national saviors each augured fourth turnings before those eras arrived. Lincoln and his Douglas debates, FDR and his pre-New Deal policy experiments as governor of New York. In recent years, many Americans have despaired that their nation no longer produces leaders who can galvanize and inspire. Yet in the turning, not the nation, yet it is the turning, not the nation, that elevates great people to the apex of power. Lincoln and FDR are both cases in point. Both had to wait for the crisis to hit. And unraveling is an era when most people of intelligence, vision, and integrity do not seek, much less get elected to high public offices. Nor is it an era when people want leaders to lead them anywhere. Indeed, the 1990s era, Americans seem to care very little about who leads and much more about making sure that we aren't led too fast or too far in any one direction. Were candidates of Lincoln's medal to emerge in a time like our own? They would strike people as odd, out of joint. Voters might admire them, but not enough to elect them, certainly not after the uh, unusual unraveling era, media destructions, deconstructions. Perhaps this is just as well. Were we to elect a Lincoln, and once again, he's speaking as a 90s era writer. He wrote this in the 90s, the mid 90s, mid to late 90s. Um, uh, were we to elect a Lincoln-like leader before the fourth turning is due, we would be following the ominous pre precedent of Lincoln's own election. Suppose some principled moralist ekes out a year 2000 presidential win in a favor in a four-way screaming match, an event like the 
like that could catalyze a crisis early, casting boomers and 13ers into the same destructive roles that were once played by the trans transcendentalists into the Gilded. After the fourth turning arrives, however, a Lincoln-like leader will be more likely to seek office, and a Lincoln-like leader could be exactly what America needs, wants, and gets. The national pastime, baseball, offers a similar lesson in seasonality. Each of the last four turnings produced an extraordinary player whose manner was much admired, but being pre-seasonal did not yet define the, pre the, re the rewarded norm. Lou Gehrig illustrated this before the last crisis, Joe DiMaggio before the high, Jackie Robinson before the awakening, Reggie Jackson before the unraveling, and Cal Ripken now. Ripken's Gehrig-like virtue is distinctly forth-turning, yet while it is admired by many people, it is not the kind of in-your-face high-stepping free agent behavior that still sells most unraveling era tickets. Personally, I think baseball is the most boring sport in the world, possibly aside from cricket. But, you know, something for everybody in this globe. And for me, it's cannabis and esoteric literature. All right. Just as one single style of leadership or hero worship is suitable for every turning, neither do any of today's familiar political philosophies offer the right answer for every turning. People who are for or against a particular policy seldom allow for changes in the saculum. Whether they want big government or lower taxes, more regulation or less, they tend to hold that view regardless of the era as though the correct prescription lies outside of time. The political and media elites abet this view. From liberalism... In conservatism to socialism and libertarianism, all the popular ideologies are non all the popular ideologies are non seasonal. To the extent their paradigms evolve, they do so linearly carved around notions of American exceptionalism. Yet the appeal of these ideologies is very cyclical. Nearly all political philosophies wax and wane with the saculum. The belief in public sector liberalism emerged in the last crisis, rose in the high, crested in the awakening, and is falling out of favor in the unraveling. Cultural conservatism has followed the same pattern, though lagged by one turning. It emerges in unravelings and crests and highs. Interest group pluralism and free market libertarianism follow yet a different path pattern. Interest group plural, pluralism and free market libertarianism follow yet a different pattern. Since both of these isms exalt rights over duties, they crested in the last unraveling of the 1920s, fell out of favor in the last crisis of the 1930s, reemerged in the high 1950s, rose in the awakening 70s, cresting again in the current unraveling 1990s. Nearly every static ideology is likely to advance in one turning per seculum. When what is when what it offers is pre-seasonal and useful, and retreat in another when it offers when what it offers is post-seasonal and harmful. In the current unraveling of the 1990s, pluralism and free markets are both very popular. The seasonal rhythm implies that the popularity of both is now cresting. I guess you could. <laughs> Yes, the van cave is at the end of the driveway right by the street. Seems like our uh, friendly neighborhood tweaker is having an interesting conversation with the passerby. That he has been thus far relatively harmless. And he greets me jubilantly as Banjo. Hey, Banjo! Because I'm often sitting on the arm playing Banjo. Anyway. Um, God dang it. Uh, some accurate predictions so far from the 90s. Um, either that or Banning sim simply took it literal and followed it as a gosh dang blueprint. They really thought that their 
brand of fascism was going to fit in the gap during this transitional period from Pisces to Aquarius. Well, they, sque they shoehorned it in everywhere, but it didn't work. Let's see. Or sure as hell ain't going to be permanent. In the current unraveling, pluralism and free markets are both very popular. The seasonal rhythm implies that the popularity of both is now cresting, where America back in the high pre-seasonal thinking would suggest pushing for more of both. Today, however, pre-seasonal thinking suggests preparing for less of both. Since come the fourth turning, America will no longer be as hospitable to the we-first lobbies and me-first free agents. As the saculum turns, their day will ultimately come again, albeit not until the middle of the 21st century. What he's not taking to account, this is interesting, what, what he's not taking into account is that these cycles seem to be speeding up according to Moore's Law. And the turnings seem to be happening, happening uh, more quickly. And it seems to be leading towards uh, what transhumanists refer to as the great singularity, um, which will be assisted by AI. And I'm not a Luddite. I'm at once a naturalist and a enjoyer of technology, maybe even a transhumanist, because I believe that AI can solve so many problems that we can spend all of our time in nature as we should. And will help, help us figure out what to do with the ecological destruction we've already done. Seasonal blindness afflicts proponents of countless well-known causes, whether feminists or right-to-lifers, the ACLU or the NRA. Supply siders or the civil rights establishment, single issue champions persistently demand unilinear progress toward a fixed programmatic goal. In a seasonal world, such efforts lead to inevitable self deception and frustration. In some areas, these causes take credit for progress that are mostly due to come anyway. In other areas, they despair over backsliding, which really isn't their fault either. Through the last three secula, most liberationist Social causes like feminism or civil rights tend to seed in a high blossom and an awakening, mature and unraveling in a decay and a crisis. Yet today, many of their proponents keep struggling for post-seasonal goals. They seek more awakening era passion in the midst of a gathering, unraveling era cynicism. It is as though by dint of sheer will they could force tiger lilies to bloom in the November woods. To cut through linear doctrines, Americans need to reappraise their opinions of the recent turnings. Many people hear grudges against a decade they recall unfavorably. For some, this is the 1950s. For others, the 60s. For still others, the 80s. These unfavorable memories reflect a negative judgment of, respectively, the high, the awakening, or unraveling, as though the era in question ought never to happen. Such judgments are misplaced. None of those turnings had to be exactly what it was. But each was a phase of history America had to transmit. What, rem what we remember as the 1960s could have been altered, perhaps made better, perhaps worse. Yet even with the altering, we could only have experienced a better or worse 1960s, not a repeat of the 1950s, or a hastening of the 1980s. The American high did not require institutional racism or sexism, but it did require a social stasis. The consciousness revolution did not require Vietnam or Watergate, but it did require a youth revolt and cultural experimentation. Today's unraveling does not require profane media or endless budget deficits, but it does require individualism and institutional decay. A fourth turning does not require economic depression or civil war, but it does require public sacrifice and political upheaval. Neither of the two major political parties has been adept at seasonalist thinking. The Republicans were worse at figuring out what the early awakening required. The Democrats worse at the early unraveling. With the fourth turning roughly a decade away, each party now has 
has it half right. Democrats have seized the saculum's autumnal instinct to harvest. Republicans, the instinct to prune and scatter. Each party is usefully pressing for some pre-seasonal policies. Democrats wish to close the gap between rich and poor, reverse the decline of the middle class, expand children's programs, while Republicans want to re defund time-encrusted bureaucracies, restore an ethic of personal responsibility, and promote traditional values. Yet both parties are also harmfully post-seasonal. In their quest for an ever bigger harvest, Democrats want to remove sacrifice ever further from the public lexicon. They seek entitlements for every victim, including the inner entire middle class without caring whether all this guaranteed consumption is sustainable. And as we've seen, that sort of unsustainable consumption is capitalism. It, and that's another thing they didn't take into account. They, they mentioned very little about the coming ecolo ecological collapse, which was pretty much set in stone when this book was written. So the two variables they didn't take into account are Moore's Law, um, the fact that the cycles that used to happen further apart are now happening at smaller intervals, and they're almost amoral about the way they talk about these cycles, which is certainly an interesting perspective to take. I mean, one can't live there, defining one's values, but it's, it is kind of a 5D, a 5D type thinking to get above time, so to speak. Both parties cater rhetorically to millennial gener children. Both are blind to what the saculum reveals about them. Democrats who praise GI seniors' wartime heroism doesn't they don't reflect on what example of sacrifice must be provided to infuse team spirit in the new generation. While Republicans who admire the GI senior citizenship don't reflect on what image of government must be reinforced to infuse civic spirit in the young. Suppose both parties continue down their linear paths through what remains of the unraveling. If so, Democrats will remain usefully linked with civic authority, but in a paradigm so oriented around a harvest mentality that it precludes any across-the-board sacrifice for a significant public purpose. Picture them in charge when the crisis catalyzes and an urgent need rises to shatter old consumption promises and ask voters to give up something. They would seem to be exactly the wrong party to come in and imperil citizenry. Alternatively, suppose Republicans keep the course, still usefully linked with sacrifice, but in a paradigm so beset with individualism as to preclude effective civic mobilization for any purpose. Picture a Republicans in charge when a sudden crisis prompts an urgent need for rejuvenated public authority to achieve a new national purpose. If this happens, they would seem to be exactly the wrong party to command a strengthening government. Come the fourth turning, America will need more personal will need both personal sacrifice and public authority. The seculum will favor whichever party moves more quickly and persuasively towards a paradigm that accommodates both. Both parties should lend seasonality to their thinking. Democrats a concept a concept of civic duty that limits the harvest. Recup Republicans a concept of civic authority that limits the scattering. If they do not, the opportunity will arise for a third party to fill the void, after which one or both of today's two dominant parties could go the way of the Whigs. Inshallah, as my brother, my uh, Islamic brother might say. History warns that when a crisis catalyzes a previously dominant political party regime can find itself directly blamed for perceived mistakes that led to the national emergency. Whoever holds party when the uh, fourth turning arrives could join the unlucky roster of the circa 1470 Le uh, Lancasterians, Cast circa 19... Circa 1570 Catholics, circa 1680 Stuarts, uh, circa 1770 Tory, Tories, circa 1860 Democrats, circa 1929 Republicans. That party could find itself out of power for a generation. Key persons associated with it could find themselves defamed, stigmatized, harassed, economically ruined, personally punished, or worse. How America should prepare. Complaints about the civic 
virtue date back to the dawn of civilization. The most eloquent commentaries on the ideal of personal sacrifice to the community. Whether a polis kingdom or superpower nation that typically arise just when people see the ideal slipping away. That much is well known. What's less well known is this. Such complaints nearly always specify that the steepest loss is of relatively recent origin. Read any of the great moralists from Cicero and Cato the Elder to Burke and Bolingbroke, and notice how they all hearken back to a time within living memory when civic giants strode the earth. American Jeremiah's on declining public spirit, whether voiced by Daniel Webster or Ross Perot, never identify the lost paragon with any era further back than the critics' own childhood. If civic virtue is so frequently lost, it must be just as frequently regained. This is what happens in a fourth turning. When a crisis mood renders societies newly desperate, it also renders them newly capable. Which is why a secular winter is to be welcomed as much as feared. As today's Americans look ahead, the challenge is to marshal the coming season's new public energies to achieve positive, not destructive goals. The better we ready ourselves collectively, the more likely we will not will be not just to survive the crisis, but to apply its fury for good and humane purposes. To prepare for the fourth turning, America can apply the lessons of seasonality. The following suggestions distinguish between actions that the nation can act on now in the unraveling, and thus that are simply not possible before the crisis catalyzes. And I'm going to read the bullet points because I have 3% left. Before my computer shuts down. Prepare values, forge the consensus, and uplift the culture, but don't expect near-term results. Number two, prepare institutions, clear the debris, find out what works, but don't try building anything big. Number three, prepare politics, don't ch define challenges bluntly, like Trump, and stress duties over rights, but don't attempt reforms that can't now be accomplished. Well, once again, this was back in, this is with his suggestion for the aughts in lieu of the 90s. Number four, prepare community, require community teamwork to solve local problems, but don't try this on a national scale. Five, prepare youth, treat children as the nation's highest priority, but don't do their work for them. Six, prepare the elders, tell future elders that they will need to be more self-sufficient, but don't attempt deep cuts and benefits to current elders. Seven, prepare the economy, correct fundamentals, but don't try to fine tune current performance. 8. Prepare the defense. Expect the worst and prepare to mobilize, but don't pre-commit to any one response. 9. What to do as an individual? Number 1. Return to the classic virtues. Number 2. Heat emerging community norms. Number 3. Build personal relationships of all kinds. Number 4. Prepare yourself and your children for teamwork. Number five, look to your family for support. Number six, gird for the weakening or collapse of public support mechanisms. I forget what number we're on. Diversify everything you do. If you want to read more, you're going to have to buy the book, I guess. Generational scripts seems really important. But um, my computer's about to die. It's a good enough book worth reading, worth having, worth referring, referring to on a seasonal basis. This is what Bannon used to break society during this winter. Perhaps we can use aspects of it to fix it as well.